Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this latest teaching session in the Technology and Future of Medicine course. Today is the day that the papers and PowerPoint critiques are due, and I'm pleased to report that I received all the ones I was supposed to receive, and they look quite good, so it's a happy day for me. And um, also happy that we have uh, Abdullah Salah back to talk about uh, technology and global citizenship. I, I learned a lot from his last uh, presentation. Um, I learned, for instance, that the idea that globalization is something totally and completely good. The world is not quite as simple as that. And uh, the other thing that I talked about last time, which is probably still true, is that in those countries affected by the Arab Spring, um, it's quite uh, amusing that you have U.S. technology being used on both sides. So the people who are doing terrible things, to people's human rights, they are using U.S. technology, and the counterinsurgents who are fighting them also are. And um, so it, it, it's hard to decide whether the U.S. Um, in those conflicts technologically is with the good guys or the bad guys. Anyway, that's it from me, so I'll pass you on now to uh, Abdullah Salah. Thank you very much, Dr. Solis. Um, so I was here last time as well and um, gave a bit of a talk. This talk's going to be a little bit different, but it still I think will have some of the main uh, highlights that the last one did have. So this, this is an agenda of just what I was hoping to talk about today, uh, just this concept of global citizenship. And I think it's a, it's a very vague concept. We'll talk a little bit about that. The role of technology in global citizenship as well as on its own. And then I'll talk a little bit about my personal journey um, when I was in Ecuador, followed by Kenya, and then uh, working on the Thai Burmese border and some of the initiatives that uh, myself and my group have, have been working on that have shed some light, at least in my mind, on the concept of global citizenship uh, and uh, how technology can be integrated to really bring out this uh, pretty vague and abstract concept. So I'll start first with uh, global citizenship. And so I think it's very difficult to define global citizenship, and so I won't try, but I think I'll leave it to um, the listeners and to the audience to really think of the imagery that that conjures in their minds as to what global citizenship is. I think really the, it's, an, it's a fairly new term, it's probably been around for about six years, and it really reflects that the world is shrinking and that there is increasing access. That now people, uh, while it might have taken days or years to, for information to travel from one point to another, is now tra transferring pretty much instantaneously. So the term, again, is a disputed term because citizenship is really a legal term. Um, the, it defines an individual belonging to a nation state and not so much as um, a planet, or uh, you cannot be a global citizen from a legal stance. So it's really more potentially about the, the global ethics of what that term means, and maybe more in particular about the rights and responsibilities that a global citizen sh w should have or does have. So I think when I said it's a legal term, I know some of the lawyers that I talked to uh, said that you cannot use the term citizenship because it really implies that it belongs to a nation. And so the global scale is not a nation. Um, and so my, I think my argument is that with an ever-shrinking world, there are a lot of things that we're doing that are passing or transgressing these boundaries of just nationalities and are really bringing up these rights and responsibilities that we have who travel across the globe and go and leave an impact, potentially a lasting impact, on a different country or a different group, and what are the rights and responsibilities associated with that? Just because we have the right to buy a ticket and to go and conjure up a plan to do something, even with the best intentions, is that the right thing to do? And with that in mind, what are some of the responsibilities? 
that such a right should um, really entail. So the role of technology, I think um, a lot of the time technology tends to be viewed maybe in the media and in a lot of stories as this saving grace that when something new is invented, um, especially in the realm of medical therapies, uh, it usually uh, is seen as this great invention that is heralded as the, the next big thing that will save a countless lives. But there's usually a dark side. And I think there is two groups of, of people and maybe two schools of thought, those who uh, don't like technology and maybe fear it. Um, and then there's a group that are very technophiles versus technophobes, I guess is what I'm, I'm getting at. So I'm uh, a physician, but I'm doing my surgical residency right now here at the University of Alberta. And we deal with a lot of cancer therapies, uh, particularly surgical therapies of cancers. And there's always new and exciting ways of um, doing something and there's a lot of publication that comes out but the question comes down to what is the evidence for, for doing such a new technology. So in my mind I think technology though is the main driving force of globalization that if it wasn't for uh, increasing transportation and communication globalization would probably be limited to trade and trade has been for ongoing for millennia and is uh, one of the main driving forces or was one of the main driving forces but now the main routes are I think technology and, and transportation and with faster availability of data it's becoming an increasingly small world but at the same time though I think the while we're able to receive information and data from a lot of different sources that data being converted to information I think we've maybe have lost a little bit of that and are more cursory in our understanding of the world. Whereas before, maybe it would take a lot longer to, to absorb that information. So like I said, technology can be harmful. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about these themes in the, different, um, in the different experiences that I had, particularly in developing technologies, implementing them in a global setting, and in the lessons that I learned and I'm continuing to learn. I think one of the biggest lessons is this concept of vertical versus horizontal transfer. So what I mean by that is vertical in the sense that something is, is uh, created like a cell phone, for example, in, um, it's invented somewhere maybe in Japan, but the manufacturing of it gets done in China and it's being supplied in Africa. So that's a vertical type where the, the patents and the knowledge to manufacture and to innovate new ideas like that are really held by the Western countries and some of the more powerful Eastern countries. But its utilization in a, uh, at the user's hands is usually just not so much how the technology was made, invented and such, but just at the user point of view. I think that in development as it comes to uh, as a specific topic, vertical uh, technologies, for example, um, anti-malarials or bed nets, hasn't worked very well. Because what happens is we invent something very good here and in theory should it have a huge impact on people's lives, gets transported to let's say sub-Saharan Africa where a number of people end up getting these bed nets, but then they're not using them appropriately. So. I was up in Turkana, which is the northern part of Kenya, and uh, we see people using um, malaria bed, bed nets for chicken coop, and they just create little uh, fences out of it. And so not, probably not the best way of using uh, permethrin coated uh, bed nets, but I think the, maybe the right way or one of the better ways of doing it is this idea of a horizontal transfer, where an idea is developed usually in academia um, or in industry. And then that same level of uh, understanding and empowerment could be transferred horizontally over to universities in sub-Saharan Africa, to industries or to build industries in, in sub-Saharan Africa, in Asia and in Latin America. But I feel like we're focusing more on the product of these innovations and are taking them over. But it leaves the users removed from the technology and 
makes the uptake of that technology a lot more difficult. And so as we move forward and think as global citizens and the responsibilities that we have in, in bringing or introducing new technologies and bringing new ideas, concepts of vertical versus horizontal transfer, I think should be the foundation of uh, how these decisions are made and how to move forward in, in doing these things. They can definitely be a catalyst for change. And um, I mentioned the cell phones, and I think a lot of individuals are very aware of, of the prevalence of cell phones and the penetrance of cell phones in, in places in the developing world. Um, in some parts of the world, it exceeds 100%. That means, uh, at least in the adult population, that means that every adult has more than one cell phone. And so, and the network that comes with that is probably more advanced than anything we know here in, South Amer in, in um, North America where, for example, my calls get dropped if I drive out to Red Deer. But if um, I'm in, in the Maasai Mara in Kenya, I can still have uh, you know, access to my Facebook and I can update images of the lion that just nearly killed me. And I think that's a, a pretty incredible use and catalyst for change. And I think um, it's opened a lot of avenues for individuals that never could have access to that kind of knowledge, never could have access to opportunities that the cell phone industry and, and communication has, has opened up. I think um, for the majority of people living below the poverty line, um, food is definitely one of the main things that they strive for, but opportunity is more important for them because opportunity creates uh, the future livelihood and future sources of food and income. And so I know countless people in various parts of the world who, if they got some money, they would buy uh, cell phone credit rather than food or rather than treat their kids. Because the number of interactions and the connection or the connectiveness that you have with m multiple individuals in your community ensure that you will have the livelihood tomorrow. And so communication is a crucial pillar of the way people in below the poverty line are living, and I think that technology is improving their lives, but with caveats. So I'll start maybe a little bit about my personal journey. I'll go back maybe even before Ecuador. I was born in Iraq, and I lived in uh, there for a little while, moved to France when I was a kid, lived there for a number of years, and we returned to Iraq after the first Gulf War and lived there under Saddam Hussein, and so saw what, what happens when, when a country um, that was very prosperous ends up being um, effectively quarantined from the rest of the world by embargoes, both economic and military embargoes, and how that affects individuals. So communication become, that was one of the first things that went, that we, we couldn't really have access to the outside world uh, insofar as telephone calls or media, but our access of, of, tech, of the, the world was really through propaganda machines used by the government so that we would understand that that's how it is. And so there was an internet when I was living in Iraq. And then we escaped from Iraq and moved to Malaysia. And I remember that I, I was living in Paris in 1993 and we had an IBM with DOS and there was no windows. We went to Iraq, we lived there for three years, and we came out, and in 1997, when I was in Kuala Lumpur, they had Hotmail, and they had Windows, and they had Lotus 1, 2, 3 for uh, the Excel, I guess, version. And uh, it was a remarkable um, change, and everybody was, I guess, connected worldwide. And the idea that you could send mail, that I would email my friends in Paris back and forth, it would take weeks before I would make it from Iraq, to Paris that you could instantaneously press a button and send that email. So we lived in Malaysia for a number of years and then immigrated to Canada in 2000 where I lived in Calgary, did my undergrad and then got into medical school here in Edmonton. Before starting my medical school in Edmonton, I went to Ecuador and um, I was doing some research um, as well as volunteering in a hospital. So the research that I was doing involved the HIV transmission through breast milk. And so women who are HIV positive or infected with the HIV virus 
um, even if they don't have full-blown AIDS, they can still shed the virus to their babies in a number of ways. There is vertical transmission, which is um, in two ways, either through breast milk when women are breastfeeding, or uh, when the baby is in the uterus, it can be transmitted across the placental barrier and goes into the baby's bloodstream. The baby is born with HIV. So the question that my supervisor and I were working on was, can we figure out a way of testing breast milk, particularly in the setting of breast infections or breast inflammation called mastitis, where the woman's breast is inflamed and when F and tissue is inflamed, and I'm, as Dr. Solas can probably speak to better than I can, uh, becomes leaky, at least in the early phases, and that leads to an increased transmission of the HIV virus into the breast milk. And usually that process is on one side of the breast rather than both breasts. And so our, our proposal was to develop a technology akin to a pregnancy test where you can dip it in milk and tell, advise women to breastfeed from the opposite breast. That way you could significantly reduce breast milk transmission uh, of HIV. Now, to me that's a, a very good idea from a technological point of view. It could potentially affect countless people's lives if uh, implemented appropriately. So we went, uh, and I was working in a lab, but I happened to be in Ecuador at the time, so I was doing that, and so I, I had the contrast of a Latin American country with the work that I was doing that was going to go back to, to the lab. And I started to think, well, why are women breastfeeding if they have HIV? I mean, that's probably the first question that anybody would ask themselves. If you know you have HIV, why would you breastfeed? So it's a more complicated issue than just um, because my baby needs milk but it's really about cultural issues. So somebody who's not breastfeeding, there is a huge stigma against that because somebody might suspect that you have HIV, as might be the case in, in this particular woman, or you um, are busy and working and there's a lot of uh, judgment that comes with not being around. And there's also the problem of alternatives. So alternatives to breast milk are bovine milk or cow milk, and formula. Formula has to be mixed with water. And water, I found out, was a more guaranteed way to die for children under the age of five, secondary to diarrheal disease, than HIV. So, in my mind, I was trying to work on developing a technology that would test breast milk for HIV because the woman's breast was inflamed. That would potentially reduce HIV transmission, but Women were breastfeeding uh, because they didn't want to give their kids dirty water. That would give them diarrhea and that would kill them. So I thought my priorities might not be in the right place right now and I should really focus on water and sanitation. And water became one of the main and most important things that um, I, I think globally are understood. And as global citizens, we probably lack enough of uh, consciousness about what water really means. And I think that no matter what has been provided, it's still just a drop in the proverbial ocean in terms of what the complexity of water and issues around water are. So with that in mind, I got into medicine and started um, talking to a number of individuals after doing some research about starting a project in Kenya to develop a new technology a ceramic water filter. So we thought maybe we'd reverse engineer a ceramic element like those you'd see in Mountain Equipment Co-op that if you take the, the ceramic um, medium and make it porous that it could pass water through and exclude bacteria. So it seemed like a really good idea if we could prove it and so in the beginning of my university, um, my medical I guess schooling, I recruited a number of people and then we went seeking a potter to help us make the pots and we sought a microbiologist to test the water, that we're, the dirty water that we were going to put through, whether we're actually getting rid of any bacteria. So the, the issue is that anytime you talk about development and water, this image comes up, comes in mind. Or a number of people when I talk about what we, we're, we've been doing, they say, oh, so you dig wells in Africa. And I think that um, it's it's a very common image, and I brought it up because I think 
that's probably to me the, the epitome of a vertical transmission model where we come up with a model of how to bring water from the ground up, we go there with the best intentions, we drill a well, we encase it, we put concrete slabs and we put a way for people to access the water. And so in a village next to the one that I was working in, there was a well just like this, which over the years, because there was water, mud could be made and a mud uh, brick industry um, sprouted up around there and people started to have incomes and people were getting the water from there and everybody started to abandon other things that they were doing because water was available locally. And then the well broke. And it took, it would take probably less than $100 to fix this well. But the people in the community didn't or couldn't pay for the well to be fixed. Now I don't mean couldn't as in didn't have the money to do it. They couldn't get enough people to agree to fix the well to do it. Nor did they have somebody nearby who had been taught how to fix these wells. And so they just stopped and the well dried up and it's just sitting there like that. And so the brick makers lost their jobs. Women who were starting to go to school because they didn't have to ferry back and forth, get, grabbing water from the river, stopped going to school. And it went back to walk to the river to grab water, to do laundry all day long, and to grab water for bathing and such. So I think that technology ha usually comes with these, like I said before, great ideas and great intentions, but unfortunately this is the usual product. And I'm not saying that this is a bad thing to do, but I think it has to come with a bigger understanding of how to horizontally transfer such a technology. So every time I see a well, I, that comes to mind. And it scares me into maybe trying to do something a little bit more creative than just develop a technology. So with that in mind, we thought, well, let's first make sure that the technology works, and then we'll figure out a way of really getting it to the people's hands that they can make the filters themselves. So we recruited these people. So this is a picture, it's not a very good picture, in the top uh, right corner. I guess in the top left corner if you're facing the screen, um, of Loris Williams, who's a potter here in Edmonton. He's a retired potter. And um, he worked in Belgravia and owned a, sh a store in Belgravia to, to make pottery. It was called the uh, um, Beaver Flats Pottery. And um, at the bottom uh, is Al Shostak on the microscope, and he's a microbiologist here at the U of A. And between the two of them, we made this little, you can see the little uh, clay pots in the um, top uh, right-hand corner, and we made these little receptacles with varied mixtures of clay and sawdust and um, different kinds of organic material, and started to test them and saw whether we could exclude bacteria based on that. And then we figured, well, we read some literature saying that if you coat a ceramic medium with, with silver, you can improve its efficacy at removing bacteria significantly. And so we, this is a silver, two silver cathodes alternating and uh, we made a silver broth, like a silver colloid broth that we started coating our filters. And lo and behold, we had filters that worked incredibly well and managed to exclude close to 100% of fecal bacteria or bacteria that causes diarrhea or in the, in the gastrointestinal tract. And we, we thought, well, if we go to Africa, uh, we could potentially teach people how to do this and it would be great. So the, around that time we started to hear that it's, this idea is not new. We thought it was original, but it's been around for a number of years, but has never reached sustainability. So we found that our idea was, well, let's make a ceramic pot, put it in a receptacle, put a spigot or a tap at the bottom of the receptacle, and cover the filter with a lid. That way the spigot gives you access to the water, the receptacle protects the, the clean water that you've made, and the ceramic pot filters the dirty water. Because we'd read some literature that if you didn't have a spigot, people would lift and, uh, the filter and scoop with their dirty hands and recontaminate your whole water supply. We found out that a number of people around the world were doing similar things, and we started talking to them, and it turns out they could never reach a sustainable model because people weren't willing to invest the cash in buying these filters.
And so, again, we, we saw how sometimes, you know, ineffective uh, technology can be in addressing a simple problem like dirty water. At least if you have a filter and you just have to give it to people, it seems simple in, in our minds. But the complexities of it are, are cultural, economic, and, and um, also technical. So we thought, well, how can we prove that these filters work if we're going to make them in the field? So one of the, actually one of the lecturers who, who was here earlier, Dr. Robert Rennie, uh, helped us purchase a portable microbio kit. We figured we'd have our own portable lab to make sure that the filters worked, even in the field. So we chose Kenya as a place because it was politically stable. It had the need and it, it had 50% of its population don't have access to clean water. They have a big pottery industry, which we thought would be very useful. And at the same time, they speak English, or at least one of the official languages is English. Now, when you're thinking of developing a, pro a project somewhere or a program, sustainability becomes one of the main issues. And, develop and having worked in South America, I spoke Spanish, but people who didn't would have a very long learning, uh, a very steep learning curve before they could become more functional in the field. So we thought we'd pick an English-speaking country and went to, you can see in the western part, to initially a place near Kitale, and then we went to a place even closer to Kitale in the western part near the Ugandan border. And we partnered with an organization, sorry, I'm skipping ahead, called uh, Common Ground for Africa. And they're a local nonprofit organization. We thought we'd keep it local, keep it sustainable, and we built what's called the Kenya Ceramic Project. Now, I'll go back to this map that I skimmed over. You can see the, the green areas are areas that uh, will require emergency relief in terms of a drought. And the orange areas are drought areas currently in Kenya. Now, this, this is a map from back in, I think, the early uh, 2000s. Um, it's even worse now. All the green has become orange, and some of the yellows become green. And so we were pretty strategically placed to service some of those areas, and that's one of the reasons we picked that place. So we started, after uh, getting some local partners, building, and we thought that if we could build an, uh, the infrastructure there locally, we could actually develop these ideas um, and develop the technology uh, by local hands and create a, a locally sustainable ceramic water filter industry. And so this is our little factory being built. There was Loris there with the hard hat in the middle. And um, this is me after the filter factory was done. We were producing filters, and we made sure that all the filters that came out met a certain guidelines for, uh, by the Kenyan Bureau of Standards and were able to uh, sell them commercially at a non as a nonprofit organization just to cover the cost of making a filter to individuals through supermarkets, pharmacies, clinics, and um, that's how that project started. Now, even with um, the best intentions and the best planning, we're still facing, even to this day, and it's been about four or five years of doing this, now we have a fully sustainable, well, maybe not sus fully sustainable, but fully Kenyan-owned and Kenyan-managed program on the ground that's manufacturing these point of fuse household water filters. And that was hard enough, but getting people to use them comes with its own challenges. And we learned that in order to get people to accept a technology, you have to invest a significant amount of time in educating people how to use it, how to service it, create an entire support industry. And that's what we're working on now, both the marketing phase and the educational phase. And so it takes a lot of work, I found out, that from wanting to do these ideas that seem very um, good, I guess, in, in, by intention, and to be a good global citizen, but technology has to come with a lot of caveats, like I mentioned before. Here's an aerial shot, or a bit of an elevator shot of our factory as it, stand, um, as it stands, I guess, today. We made it a little bit bigger now, but that's pretty much how it is. This is me in the back of a van designing new machines, and this is part of our production line for making ceramic water filters. So you can see that we press them with hydraulics, and this is the insides with a lot of our workers working there. This, you can see in the top shelves, a whole bunch of filters stacked. And um, make, keeping quality control is incredibly difficult in a place like Sub-Saharan Africa because the environment is dirty, 
you don't have access to the same technologies that you would hear for keeping sterile environments, especially when you're manufacturing uh, a health product. But it's a constant struggle, and, but it, it's a necessary one. Some of our workers, making sure to date the filters so that we can track them, and more people here are some filters drying on the shelves. And this is how we fire them in a big, big kiln that we ended up building. So a lot of quality control measures are taken, testing the flow rates and testing the microbiological efficacy of these filters, because the whole point of this is to prevent diarrheal disease in babies. And so in order to ensure that that tra transfers from beyond just the lab to people on the ground, we, we are now preparing to launch a study to test groups that are using the filters and groups that are not, and seeing whether we can clinically or actually in the field reduce diarrheal disease. That is not just in the lab, this makes, leads to a benefit, but people using dirty hands can still contaminate themselves, and this whole thing might be a moot point. And so we wanna make sure that if we're transferring a technology, now this is probably a, an example of a horizontal transfer of a technology, but it comes with so many challenges in making sure that even the technology is being used appropriately and we're able to reduce gastrointestinal disease. This is a promo shot of one of our filters, um, just how it stands with the brand name Sarah Maggi, which is ceramic, uh, short, Sarah is short for ceramic, and Maggi is the Kiswahili word for water. It's one happy worker. This is some of our sales team and so in order to sell a product out in the, in the supermarkets, it's very, very um, difficult to convince people who are living at the edge of poverty where their disposable income is, um, if they're making $2 a day and their disposable incomes are only 10% of that $2, it's very difficult to, to convince people to spend any amount of money on something. Now our filters, that lasts for approximately two to three years for a family of five people, and it prevents diarrheal disease for those two to three years, um, costs about $10. So it's not much by anybody's standards here, but there the opportunity cost of the, that $10 is very high. And so people have to have a very convincing explanation of why they're gonna spend all that money to buy a filter. So we tried first to go with, well, this is good for you, we'll improve your health, and that didn't work. We tried that for approximately 18 months of doing different surveys and working with groups and educating and going by it with the public health messages like quit smoking, which hasn't really worked too well. Um, so we thought about it and did a lot of surveys and research and talked to a number of individuals, and what we found was, well, it comes down to, like I said, opportunity cost, but also where are they spending their money? And so we realized that children, their children and their family members get typhoid or get cholera, and that's because of dirty water. And so we went and costed how much it would be to treat one individual for typhoid. And they, it depends on the area that these people are living in, for example, but on average, we found that people spend approximately $30 or $20 to $30 per person per treatment of typhoid. Whereas our filters cost $10 for a family of five for two to three years. And it wasn't until we really contrasted the two and did market days and had a huge marketing and educational push that we started to really move product from our shelves to people's homes. And then people started to, you don't need to be there to convince them, but the word started to spread and to trickle in the communities that individuals and especially women who are the driving forces of any health initiative started to ask, well, don't you have your Sarah Maggi? And that's when the ripple effect started and people are now slowly, but hopefully surely, gonna buy more of these filters that will impact their quality of life. But importantly, I mean, when it comes to opportunity cost, so this investment beyond just the money that they would spend for, for direct 
therapies for typhoid or against typhoid or cholera, but it leads to a more or improved quality of life. And so these girls that I talked about earlier that had to quit work or had to quit school and come and ferry water can now go back to school. And people can be healthier and work more productively, generate more incomes, etc. It's just some more happy people. And we ended up partnering with the government just to help promote these ideas that rather than just um, promoting um, clean, clean water just as this abstract term or uh, hand washing in a place where maybe there is no running water and there is no soap, that we started to promote point of use, just household water systems where people might get their water from rainwater, from uh, springs and streams, or from uh, the tap even, and they can put it in the, the receptacles and get clean water at the tap level. Now, our main struggle right now is how do you convince people to keep their hands clean and keep the cups that they're drinking from clean? That way, all this work doesn't get contaminated by a dirty cup. And so after about five years of working on this, day in, day out, uh, we've got the, the water to the tap. Now we have to overcome people pouring it and then contaminating it at this point. So that's a whole new challenge and we're working on it and hopefully making some, some headway, but it's, it's difficult. So we also track uh, geographic information systems of how the filters are being introduced and I just showed you a map of uh, this um, drought area just to contrast that the, I guess you, oops, my point, this is the, the screen that I'll show you next is right here. These are some of the areas that we're partnered with through the Empath Network and are trying to supply all these communities here. This is where our factory is. It's near the Kitali area. So it's a significant am amount of people and we've managed to supply 3,000 filters now. So at an average family size of five people, that's about 15,000 people that have access to clean water. And that number, for the majority of these years, was ensuring that the product was safe and ensuring that the technology was sustainable and the people were trained to be able to continue this. So now when somebody breaks their filter at home and it doesn't work anymore, they can go to the supermarket and buy a filter that's not exuberantly expensive or made somewhere else in, in, in a different part of the world. Um, the government of Alberta was, uh, I guess, excited about the, the notion of, of the filters and invited us to meet the royal couple when uh, they were in, in town and uh, we got to present them and um, I have to say they were very interested in the idea and they saw the need because they do a number of that work in developing countries as well. Now, so we have a technology now that works and is tested and we know that we can uh, exclude bacteria or we can exclude parasites from the water. But we thought that wouldn't be enough. What, how, you, how could you take this platform and modify it and add things to it and improve it? That way it doesn't just become a one-trick pony but uh, doing more than just that. And so we came up with this idea of the filter diversification project and the goal is really to expand the ceramic water filter initiative to deliver better drinking potable water and exclude things like arsenic, fluoride, and organophosphates from the water. And we were still working on different technologies and different initiatives, but because we've come up with this challenge, we're now able to come up with new, uh, I guess, designs and new ideas with, by collaborating with people around the world. So we've started to collaborate with people at Princeton, at Brown University, and are talking to universities in Kenya, and are opening this idea that, what if you could design, using this same ceramic filter element, what if you could design the second generation of water filters? And so, beyond just the bacteria, you could remove anything you want. And, um, but of course, the more things you add, the more expensive it is. And so really the model, that, the business model that we're thinking of is to create a platform that's really um, like the iPhone, for example, is with apps. So you have a phone that is good and tested and works well, but you can change its application to a particular circumstance by downloading an application. 
And so we want our ceramic filters to be able to have that versatility in developing this technology and create better access in a community. So let's say the community has uh, waterborne diseases like cholera and bacteria and such, but they also have an arsenic problem. That you don't, not everybody needs an arsenic remover, but that particular community does, so you can help develop that industry there. And so they can make um, a second modular intervention that can fit in the first one and uh, help create both income and a new technology. So a more tailored solution that's more economical and more feasible for that particular community. So that's on the waterfront.